Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, back, we're back to our uh, livestock integration producers webinar series, and uh, we're taking a little bit different tact today. Most of the previous ones in this series have been integrating livestock within an annual cropping system. And our guest today is Kevin Wiltsey, and Kevin and his wife Mandy have a farm and ranch operation in Timken, Kansas, down by the Great Bend area. And they are integrating it into their annual cropping rotation and system, but he's also converted uh, a pretty decent number of acres over to perennials and, uh, and, and not, not taking old perennial ground and making new perennial ground, but taking crop ground and turning it into perennials. And so uh, really he's going to be focusing a lot on that aspect of the grazing operation. So uh, just because he doesn't talk about, integrating the annual cover cropping into the annual cropping system. He's still doing some of that, but we've asked him specifically to talk more about the perennial emphasis that he has been putting into their operation and, and the reasons why they're doing it as well. So I've uh, known Kevin for many years. Uh, Kevin was a customer early on in the life and history of green cover. He's ordered seed uh, lots and lots of years for us. He's been one of our featured speakers at our uh, so a health conference we have at our Iola, Kansas facility. He says, I know he's spoken at Hotel on the Plains and so I'll help you. Uh, so he's he's uh, no stranger to presenting and sharing some of the great work that they've been doing on their farm and ranch operation there. So we're grateful uh, for him being here. And one last thing, and he'll talk about this a little bit, or at least I think I can talk him into talking about it. He's also raising grass finished beef uh, direct to the consumer. We're just talking about this. I think he's got one for me that he's going to be bringing up next week. So uh, I'll be eating some great ribeyes from uh, Kevin's herd uh, here very shortly again. So uh, looking forward to, to the conversation here, Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead and you can uh, share your screen and share the slides there. And then kind of when you wrap that up, uh, I'll come back on and we'll have a discussion. And again, like Jonathan said, please, uh, folks, uh, ask your questions. Put them in that Q&A box and we will discuss those as we're uh, getting going here. Right. Is that working? Oh, it was. And it, oh, there you go. You bet. Okay. Yep, you're good. Um, well, thanks, Keith, for asking me to be on here. And um, yeah, I've known, known you guys for a long time. And that's one thing with this whole soil health journey. It's been, for me, it's been a blessing to meet great people. And you and Brian are, are two of those. And um, yeah, it's an honor to be a part of this today. So um, like Keith said, we farm and ranch west of Great Bend, Kansas, and it's about 45 miles straight south of Hayes, if, if you're familiar with the area. Um, we're in a 22 to 24 inch rainfall zone here. Um, yeah, cash crops and, and cattle primarily. Um, there's my family. My two daughters are home this summer, so they, they're helping with the labor force. And then I also have one full-time employee, Hunter, that he just started in December and kind of threw him into the fire. He's he's learning a lot and he's doing a he's doing a great job of kind of turned over a lot of the grazing management decisions to him and and teaching him along the way. So um he's really he's really observant and he's really uh yeah, it's, it's been good because he kind of gets what we're trying to do and he can see the results that we've been getting. So that, that's helped. Um, and like Keith said, we do we do a lot of uh, um, grazing livestock integration on our cropland, um, but that's really not going to be the focus today. If you have questions about it, feel free to feel free to ask them. Um, but but today we're going to talk, I guess, mostly about the perennial systems and and kind of why really we decided to go this route um, and that's kind of this is a picture this year of of a perennial that we're on right now so um and i guess initially a little brief history i guess or observations i've made through the years we started we started 100 percent no-till in 1997 when we came home from dakota lakes um, research up there in south dakota and and we, as like, as Jay Fuhrer likes to say, no-till by itself is not enough. And we learned that pretty fast. We were, we were trying to do no-till and we still, we were expecting our infiltration rates to go up and organic matter to go up. And 
and we just really didn't see that. Um, our soils are there are silty clay soils. They and they it's really hard to get them to take water in. Um, and even we started integrating cover crops, and we still really struggle with water infiltration. And then, you know, wind erosion is still a big problem. In fact, this year in in our area of Kansas, I've never I've never seen dirt blowing like in my lifetime like we have this spring here. So, um, and these and these are on fields where people are trying you know trying to keep cover on them, and um, really from July twenty. 21 till now we're, we've been in a drought and and when you're in those drought conditions it's it's really hard to to grow and to keep cover on your soil um so so primarily probably my number one reason and this was back probably in 2013 or something we i really decided that i wanted to fix try to fix this in my lifetime like how do we improve our infiltration rates and you know we're always supposed to mimic nature and and uh, nowhere in nature does do you see perennials unless we screwed up the annual system. So, so that's kind of the route I wanted to start experimenting with. Um, and then also economics was a big driver too. So that's initially um, kind of what what my reasons were for for trying to implement these things. And and then even today, you know, this this is a field this year that you know coming coming out of well, still in a drought probably, but, uh, you know, we have decent cover on these fields. Um, in this field in particular, we've, we've implemented soil practices for a long time, cover crops and, and managed grazing. And, um, this was some 60 inch corn and we had really decent cover. I thought, you know, for the conditions this year, and then we interceded covers into that. And then we had a five inch rain that evening and our soils just they really struggle to take water in, especially in those intense rainfalls. So, so yeah, that, uh, that's a couple of reasons. And then, you know, as years go along then we see stuff like this now, and, um, it's not only pigweeds, but it's kosher and it's, you know, chinch bugs and it's, you know, army worms and all these pests. And, and every day we wake up and, and we think, think of ways to try to kill all this stuff. And, and, you know, as it, expenses are going up, machinery costs are going up, more and more herbicide, more and more insecticides in these programs. And, and really, we just try to, we're trying to get away from that. So, and then, you know, kind of the opposite side of the coin is, is are these perennial systems. And this is a field of mine. This is the third season um, this, this year on this field in particular. And we've got over 30 different species in this mix. And instead of you know, going out in the field and trying to figure out how we're going to kill something, you walk out in this field and it's all about life. Um, you know, we let everything live in this field, like the wildlife and the, the insects and the birds and all the plants and the soil biology. We don't kill anything with, with two exceptions, and that's um, cedar trees or a, a thorny locust tree or something. So, so it really is refreshing and it if I'm having a bad day, that's this is where I go, and I it kind of restores your soul to walk in these fields and and just observe all the the life around you. So if somebody was asked me today the number one reason why we're doing this sort of stuff. It's it's that for me. Um, so I got this from Ranching for Profit. You have the perfect system in place to get the same results you're currently getting, and I tell myself that every day. So I I try to think of ways to improve. And then the other quote I love, I got this off the Working Cows podcast, which I highly recommend. And Burke Teichert, anything he says, you need to be listening. And he said, you have to become open-minded, but you have to figure out how to do it without being gullible. And I think that's a, a really good quote when you're, you know, you hear things like like I'm trying to present to you today about perennials or 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 anything in, in the soil regen field. It's like a lot of this stuff sounds good, but you know, but does it make sense? Do the economics um, make sense? You know, I don't, maybe we need to start small and, and make sure, you know, we're not going to go broke doing something like this. So I really want to share a little context with you because this makes a huge difference. Um, and we're fortunate in our operation. We have a, a decent land base. that's all contiguous and that's really helped with the livestock integration part. Um, 
so we wanted to build this business that's resilient. Um, we knew livestock were going to be crucial for that. Um, when we think about adding value to our products, I, I also think about adding value to our acres and um, livestock integration is a, is a good way to do that to both your cash crops and your cover crops. Um, so, so when we're looking at this, we also rent and farm ground that's, you know, 20 miles away that some of these practices, they just don't make sense, you know, for people, or maybe you have a, a, a lease arrangement that doesn't allow this. So, so that that's okay, you know, but maybe there are places where you can implement these sort of practices. Um, so we knew this is what we wanted to build. And so we spent, we spent a considerable amount of time and, and investment on infrastructure because this had to be easy um, to make this work. So we, we put in lots of water lines and, and lots of, of tire tanks and uh, um, a lot of tire tanks were placed in areas like this field where we can still water cropland and also um, our perennial systems or native prairie. And we also um, implemented multiple, you know, Plosson valve risers along the way so we can quick couple water and make this whole thing easy. And we've also installed miles and miles of high tensile fence on perimeters. Um, so in the summertime, we use a lot of, a lot of portable water and, and we've switched this summer to using these barber tanks and, and I'd highly recommend that on anything you're grazing with, with pears. So the calves can drink, you always got water and it's really, you can visually see the difference in the stress on the animals. And so, so today we've built this system where we've, the yellow on this map, we've implemented like 550 acres or so roughly of perennial systems. Um, so about 30% of the cropland we've converted. Um, we're gonna do another quarter and 80 this winter. I'd like to get that up to about 50% of the cropland converted to perennial systems. Um, the dark green are just native pastures. And then we we put in over 30,000 feet of water line and multiple tanks and the orange are uh, pollinator borders, buffers that we put in and then we fence those and we use them as lanes to move cattle around the landscape. So I wanna, I'll get specifics into the different perennial systems that we've kind of looked at. Um, and one of them, this, this picture here is a cool season pasture. And when we implemented this, um, this was kind of maybe before diversity was really at the forefront of my mind. And, and there's, there's four cool season grasses in this mix, chicory and alfalfa, and we just didn't have enough diversity. And we terminated this pasture here just a few weeks ago, actually, to go to something different. But um, and cool season pastures in my environment uh, really don't perform that well. Um, we might try to keep some in the mix, but we're really probably going to steer away from these. Just another note, you'll see at the top of some of these slides I pulled from some of my other presentations, you'll get an idea of kind of the animal days that were harvested off of that off of those particular fields for that year. Um, and another point I want to make is when we're, whenever we're on these perennials, we are, we're on daily moves pretty much all the time, trying to manage our grazing. Um, it's better for the soil, better for the grass, better for the cattle, better, you know, manure distribution and, and all that. So um, it's something we've really tried to focus on. Um, Keep in mind when you seed these things back to perennial systems, it doesn't mean they're native. So we, when you do get in a wet spill, we still have trouble with pugging and where we might, if it's an extended wet period, we might pull off and go to native. It just, it takes time for these things to build up and, and we're just not there yet. So um, one of the first presenters you had on this uh, livestock integration uh, webinar series talked about pasture cropping annuals into into perennials and we've done a fair bit of that and we're really with no success whatsoever in our climate and environment. Um, this was some sorghum sedan we seeded into that cool season pasture and, and we just don't get enough rainfall to make this work. Um, I think under irrigation or obviously some places this, this could really work well. Um, the, the last three years under in drought we've this is about all our those cool season pastures have done. Uh, we've turned out on them in the spring just for a place to go. And and we really, we tightened up these cattle into really small paddocks and just unrolled hay out there for them to supplement them along to get us through the drought. And 
Um, we've added a lot of carbon, a lot of nutrients to this pasture, uh, but it just really hasn't performed like we want. Whoops. Next one. Um, another perennial we were kind of excited about was Kernza. Um, put that into the into a field would have been in 2020, I think the fall of 2020. Um, part of the farms program, we seed it as a monoculture. It's it's really kind of intriguing to me to be able to have the opportunity to, to maybe harvest a high value grain or seed crop off of it, and then still have the flexibility to be able to 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 graze it. Um, again, seeded as a monoculture, you can tell Kearns it has has a lot of potential for a forage when it rains. Um, the first year, it did really well. We harvested the seed, stripped it off. Um, they kind of they kind of really want the the residue taken off the field to get the sunlight back down to the crown. So we we swath and bailed the residue, and then. Um, so part of my project for the farms program was to to uh, pasture crop diverse annuals into this, and that's how we were going to add diversity. and And they just never ever performed for us. Um, so we since have taken this kerns out of production as well. Um, that was just that first fall when we tried to pasture crop. You can see very little of it emerged and survived our the hot dry summers. Um, this. This particular mix is probably, well, by far and away is is what we're going to today. And we've tweaked this through the years. Jim Garris kind of helped me design this from the get-go. And and then we, um, Doug Spencer, he's a state grazing specialist in, at Kansas with NRCS. And he's been a tremendous resource for me. And, and I've learned from Doug that the native prairie kind of in our area was was 85% by weight um, grasses and about 13% forbs and 2% shrubs. The forbs by population or in plant species far outnumber the grasses, but by weight, the, the native prairie was about 85% um, grasses. So, so we look at that when we try to design the mix. I think we should probably look at that when we try to design cover crop mixes as well. Um, but as we go down through there, we've got, you know, the tall grasses, the, the mid grasses, the short grass, a couple cool season grasses in there. Alfalfa is not a native, um, but, but I like it in the mix at half a pound. You don't, you don't want too much alfalfa because it'll overpower those, those natives when you're trying to get them established. Uh, sweet clover is good. The Sicer milk veg, I really like that at a half a pound in the mixes. Um, the Illinois bundle flower is good. Maximilian sunflower, we had we backed that down to about a tenth of a pound. Um, purple prairie clover, we've seen all these except lead plant is the one, and that's that would be a, a shrub. Um, and we we have not seen that in any of our mixes. Um, heath aster, we've seen dog gay feather, chicory and plantain, we threw in the last mix. And again, those are two that you're not gonna you don't want to put a bunch of that in because it'll overpower those natives when they're trying to get going. And I think even that quarter pound rate is is probably a bit much. I think next time we'll be down to maybe a tenth of a pound of those two. Um, so of the cool season, one of the advantages, well, two advantages of the cool season mixes is one, they're a lot cheaper, and two, they establish faster. Um, one of the yeah, the big drawbacks to these more native mixes are, is it takes some time to get them established. But year one. If we do this right, we we can still harvest 45 animal days per acre typically. And it's in this picture here, this was a lot of volunteer grain sorghum and pig weeds and other weeds. But we still graze this year one, um, managing our grazing, of course. Um, year two, you really don't see much. A lot of the weeds go away. The perennials are just trying to take hold. And the whole thing kind of just sleeps for that year. So a lot of times in year two, we're not we're not taking any grazing off of it. If we do, it's very light. But then the third year, these things just explode. It's hard to believe it goes from this to this in, in three years. And, and that's that's been what we've seen. It's it's kind of been a challenge through the years trying to match kind of what, what do we need for cattle numbers? How are these things gonna perform? Um, but we've kind of fine-tuned kind of what we can expect um, out of these. And they, they're just, 
I mean, it's just a really unbelievable sight when you go out in these fields and see all the life that's out there. Um, and then again, managing our grazing on that's absolutely key. Um, trying to maximize grazing, utiliz grazing utilization and trampling and all that stuff. Uh, this was another mix year three. Um, we went through this later in the season. It was obviously stage three grass, but that's okay. I don't mind if some of this goes to seed some years. Um, and then this was another field. This was the fourth year on on one field. And and when you look at these pictures, I want you to keep in mind um, the drought conditions that we've really had from July of 21 till really pr present. June This June, we've had about nine inches of precipitation. Um, but yeah, in and out of D4 drought and and to see these things, the resilience that we build into this is is really quite amazing. This was in June, you know, the first of May of, of 22, we didn't know if we were going to have much to graze. And, and we got, you know, in 22 and 23, we both got rains in, in both May and June, both years. And, and these things just really exploded. And the diversity out there is just amazing. And... So this, yeah, this is that same paddock, what we were leaving behind. And then this was the same paddock in September. At this time, we were we were D3 drought at that time, going into D4. And this was the regrowth that we had on that same paddock. And and at the same time, our the neighbor's pastures were completely, you know, grazed down, overgrazed, and starting to feed hay already. And this was the regrowth that we that we saw. And so last year, they talk about not being able to figure out our how many cattle we should have. So going into uh going into May last year, we were so dry we we started de we destocked all our yearlings and tried to keep the cow herd intact. And then we got rain in May and June and we got ample forage again for the year. And we ended up not grazing about 320 acres that didn't get grazed during the summer at all. And so we went through that this winter we stockpile grazed it. I wanted to get it trampled down and um so we had rain and some moisture in December and January and the, and the Western wheatgrass really took off. So the cattle were getting their, their protein out of that Western wheat and, and making them, making them eat some of that dry with it. So that it's just really neat to see these perennials take advantage of the moisture when you get them. And, and that's the big thing with the perennials versus the annuals. You know, we have living roots 365 days a year. We have, you know, soil armor 365 days a year. And, from my observations, I just don't believe that in my environment we can do that with annual cropping because we we go through these extended periods of drought where we just can't we just can't keep living roots in the soil and we can't keep the soil covered. Um, so yeah, that's what um, this spring again in May we're really dry in May we, we're making plans to move cattle out and then in June we started getting rain and. And then this is what it's turned into. So starting to get questions from neighbors about this. They they come by and they're asking me, like, they just can't believe how much grass we have. And it's and it's just a testament really to the grazing management more than anything. But here's what we're leaving behind. Um, again, this is that a third, third year. This is on this mix. Just took this picture a few weeks ago. And just all that diversity out there is just really an amazing thing. Um, just a few pictures of, I like to do fence sign pictures of where we're, what we're taking off, what we're leaving behind and what the next paddocks look like. Um, this year we're moving, we're changing our grazing up on some, some fields and kind of give Hunter this idea and he's taking off on this and doing a really good job. We're, we're changing our grazing from one direction to another. So now our paddocks this year are on these, some of these perennials are, are long and narrow and we the on the paddock on the right the day before we just had first turned them in there so we were kind of just guessing 45 animal days to start that's what we gave them and you know and after a day of grazing then you adjust that we were we were leaving too much so we've got those pinched down we're taking 60 animal days off of this now but when you leave these these corridors or paddocks long and narrow these as these cattle will go up and down like two times before you're done moving the poly wires just it just completely changes their their uh, traffic pattern and grazing habitat or grazing habits. It's kind of fun to watch and observe. 
Um, so I, I want to spend a little time here just talking about results that we've seen. Um, this was a Kernzen in uh, May of 22 up there. It says this was obviously very droughted. This is monoculture Kernza, keep in mind, the kind of a point I want to make here. Um, and then this was in June. We we didn't harvest the Kernza for two years. We just swapped and bailed it because of drought. But we would get a rain and it would green up for about a week and then it would go back to drought conditions. So we ended up swapping and bailing this Kernza. But I took these other pictures. This is the same day. Okay, drought stress monoculture perennial versus diverse perennial mix. And these fields are, you know, within a half to three quarter mile apart. These these fields are just thriving. And there's another one, same, taken the same day. So just the power of diversity is, is truly amazing. Uh, more, more pictures of just kind of resilience in the, in the uh, program that we're developing. Um, and, and these are the grass finished beef. He kind of touched on this. And we harvest our grass finished beef towards the end of June. And we, we time that so we have, it kind of matches up our, our spring rainfall. So we have, you know, lush growth. And we're finishing on be these beef on this diverse um, perennial pastures because we feel that's important to produce quality beef. Um, so, and you really need, you know, 190 to 100 days of good quality finishing towards the end, I think, to, to really put the, the finish on the animals. And so we were, the last two years have been a struggle. We're, you know, this is almost the end of April in a drought, and we we don't have anything green to graze to speak of. There's a little bit of the deep-rooted forbs, the alfalfa and the sicer milk that just started to green up, but it's just so dry. So we we need a place to go with them. So we turn them out and we slow them down instead of speeding up the moves, and we would let them graze for a day, and then we supplement alfalfa for two days, and then we'd move them to a new paddock. And then we started getting some rains and they really took off. And then this was in July that year. So um, yeah, and the cattle, they still finished. I mean, they got fat and and the beef was excellent. Those uh, 23, those beef, we sent three of those beef samples off. We're taking part in the Bionutrient Food Association beef study. Um, so we sent ribeyes from three different animals off to them along with forage and now or forage samples, manure samples, soil samples. Um, so we're anxiously awaiting all the results from that. Um, I will share that the the three beef, the average omega-6 to omega-3 ratio was 1.41 to 1. Um, so that's that's a good deal. Um, yeah, I talk about life in these fields. It's fun to go out there and then move the polywire and then you see something that wasn't in the mix and hasn't been there for years and all of a sudden shows up. This is wild bergamot. And, and we see this in... Uh, the fields all the time, species that we didn't see that are that are just showing up. And then the birds, the brown-headed cowbirds, and we have, you know, eastern and western meadowlarks, the dick sissel, the bobwhite quail, and just all these birds and numbers in these perennial fields is just is just really cool to see and a sign of a healthy ecosystem. And the dung beetles are tremendous. Um, it's amazing how many dung beetles you must have when you move the poly wire and the next day all the manure pads are just covered in dung beetles. Is It's just amazing to think of that the numbers, that biology out there. And there's and different different species of dung beetles as well. Um, what do we see in the soil? Um, so when we're annual cropping, we see this a lot on the left, platiness where we you know, you don't have something growing for a while, the, the biology collapses, your soil structure collapses. And then when we move to these perennial systems, it doesn't take long at all for all that platiness to go away and you start to build um, good aggregation. And this is another one. These fields are all in the same section, literally across the fence, just managed differently. The one on the left is long-term no-till with some cover crops um, grazing. The one in the middle is, is very intensively cover cropped and grazed you know, soil pra practices for a long time. And, and then the one on the right, that was like five years in a perennial. So big, make big changes fast. And how does this happen? Um, it's, it's the roots, the, those warm season grasses have tremendous fibrous roots, but these forbs in here, the sicer milk bits and the alfalfa and the chicory, it's, I mean, it's, you just can't do this with annual crops. The roots of those perennials are just, just amazing. And the, the thing you notice is the aggregation at depth. 
like we're putting aggregates way deeper than we ever could in our annual system. And I think that's really important because then when you have aggregation to depth, you have oxygen, you know, going deeper into the profile, your water's moving better through the soil. You're going to have biology, more life, you know, deeper into the soil profile as well. And then uh, Jay Fuhrer did this on my place. It'd be a couple of winters ago. This was, we were in D4 drought. This was in January. So middle of winter and the soils were beyond dry. He dug three soil pits. And the one on the left was that uh, annual crop, you know, in, intensive soil practice is good, you know, doing a good job on it. The middle um, sample was uh, monoculture Kernza. So monoculture perennial. And then the one on the right is a diverse perennial mix. So the aggregate stability is far and away superior in those perennial mixes. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of about all I had, Keith. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. Sorry, that, was, that was uh go 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 back a couple slides to some of that soil. That's just some beautiful looking soil. Have yeah, that, and then some of the other ones where you were comparing them. There, that's just just incredible soil structure. And and I I, I will come back to the concept of aggregation at depth because that is a concept that that uh, Christine Jones was recently through. The United States here and talked extensively about that. So I do want to come back to that. But I want to go back to the beginning. Um, and first of all, put in a plug for you mentioned that you went on the Dakota Lakes bus trip. Uh, Brian and I went on that too. Really a life changing moment for many of us who are kind of in this, whether you call it soil health or regenerative ag. What, what made that what made that trip such a powerful impact on you? Um. I was blessed to have my dad go along with me at the time, you know, so I was fortunate that he went along and saw it as well. So it made the transition easier, but, you know, and this, that was at a time where there was no mention of cover crops, the Dakota lakes as well. But, but I guess initially it was just, you know, it was a lure of, of growing more crops, you know, instead of a wheat fallow system or wheat sorghum fallow system, we're going to grow a cash crop every year. Um, the idea that, you know, organic matter was going to go up, uh, infiltration was going to go up, uh, weed pressure was going to get less, you know, and a lot of that, it was true in the beginning. And then, you know, then the wheels kind of fell off the bus on the no-till by itself. Yeah. Um, so it didn't take long for us to, you know, to start experimenting with cover crops, you know, and that. When Adam Mir Calgary was a no-till on the plains, you know, then people started going home and and uh, experimenting with that. But like I say, even with cover crops and stuff, we still our soils just really struggle to take in water. And and I guess for, for me, I really I really want to figure that out before I'm done farming. So that's was one of the primary reasons when I started why I started doing perennials initially. But well, the way those pictures look, I think you're you're very well on your way. Do you want to put in a plug for the Dakota Lakes or the, the Northern Bus Tour? If you're interested, No Tell on the Plains is doing another one this year. I don't know that they're sold out yet, but they probably are getting close. Uh, if you go to uh, notill.org, you can get information. That's July 29th through the 31st. And uh, it's going to be kind of fun because um, I, I can't remember what year Brian and I went on that. But, but again, it was very impactful for us. Brian's going again this year and taking one of his grandsons with him. So again, it's, it's cool to see, yeah. you know, you went with your father, you know, I went with my brother. It's just cool to see the generational type things and the family connections because it does make a difference and an impact. So if anybody that's watching this is interested go to notill.org and you can get all that information, they'll be going to Dakota lakes. They'll be going to Rick Beaver's farm. They're going to the Binokin farm, which, which uh, is what Jay Fuhrer, Gabe Brown kind of started. Jay's still very involved in that. Blackleg Ranch up there. Uh, so it's going to be a great trip, and hopefully uh, you can get in on that yet if you want to. And that, um, that 
bus tour, we came back from that. I'm like, we went to Dan Forgey's place and, you know, Dwayne Beck. Mm -hmm. And and we literally came back from that. And dad and I, the next day, we went to John Deere and ordered a new no-till drill. Like, and sold all the tillage equipment. It had that much of an impact on our operation. So that's that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the John Deere dealer should have been sponsoring. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> But yeah, and 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 you're not you're not alone in that. There were uh, a tremendous amount of people, and you know, I've said for many years. I think Dwayne Beck has had more of an impact, especially an economic impact, on farming in our area. You know, these mm -hmm. southern central and high plains than anybody else in our generation, because he's just fundamentally changed the the landscape of agriculture for yeah. us. But, uh, yeah, so impressive uh, if you can get to that. Uh, I want to go back early on. You said economics were a big driver for you in switching over to perennials. Yeah. There are lots of other reasons too: the infiltration, the erosion, right. and all that. Can you talk a little bit more about what those economics look like? I mean, this year, yeah, sure. You know, probably eighty percent of the people growing a row crop are going to lose money this year, even with a good crop. Right, and that's and that I should assess more on that. That's uh, that's key. Um, and especially when you look at expenses, the way, you know, and we saw this in 11, 12 and 13 and, you know, everything goes up and then, you know, now it's at a new, a new level machinery costs and, and all these inputs, we're putting more and more chemicals on. And, and then for me, it's a realization of trying to go these, grow these grain crops. Should we even be growing them anyway? You know, in the Western Great Plains and these brittle environments, which we're, which we're in, does it really make sense? to be growing some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, the economics for me, I'll, and I'll just be blunt in, in 2023. Um, so we, our gross revenue per animal day grazing was a little over $4. So when you look at that, um, so say, say we harvest 60 animal days off of a perennial and we grow several four four $240 an acre. And then, you know, our expenses are coming out of that. And I pay, you know, I pay cash rent on some of this farm for cropland rental rates. Um, but beyond that, you know, we had our infrastructure, you know, we amortized some of that out. Um, some of it we got funded, helped funded through Equip. You know, other than that and labor, we just, we don't put anything into these systems anymore. There's no chemicals or fertilizers. It's just, it's just the time that it takes to go move the cattle. So when you look at that, the return on that and compare that like in our environment where you know most farmers are wheat sorghum fallow and the wheat is break even at best and so it takes you two years to grow a wheat crop that that's going to break even probably most years maybe yeah. and then maybe you make you know milo we usually can make some money on and then and like does that really make sense and for me it really doesn't um i would rather you know i look at this more like it's a lot less risk and we're, we're, we're making, we're making money every year. Maybe it's not as much in the good year, but it's, we're certainly not losing any money on any given year. Um, and I'm, and I might add that that $4 gross, that's, um, that's figuring all everything. And when we look at that, we're, we're taking cattle prices are high. So we, we took an a big opportunity cost off of that. So actually for 2023, it would have been significantly higher, but we're trying to be pretty conservative in our, in our numbers. So, and that was average across the farm, as far as natives, perennials and cover crops, that's, that was across the farm. It was over $4 an acre for gross per animal day. Yeah. $4, $4 per AUD, not per acre. Yeah, per animal day grazing. So, and that includes, you know, like you said, value added. We're we're marketing some grass finished beef, you know, as well, and we sell different classes of animals as far as females. You know, we we do take cattle to the sale barn, but we try to get, you know, we try to get away from that as much as possible. And and same thing if you're grain farming, you know, when you're in commodity agriculture, it's it's a little, um, you know, it, it's just designed to be a break even deal. So, to be honest with you. I want to pick up the conversation on the the grass fed grass finished animals. D did you have to shift your genetics when you kind of switched to this type of system to to get animals that would perform better on this type of a system versus just 
hey, I'm going to get them to 600 pounds and sell them to a feedlot. Right. Yeah, that's completely different genetics that's required. And um, yeah, so so we've we shifted genetics several years ago and we just continually kind of evolve those and we kind of keep some of our own genetics back to us, raise our own bulls and that sort of thing and bring new genetics in. But it's, yeah, there's definitely, you definitely have to do that. We've, we've tried buying a few animals before, like to throw in with the grass finish program and they're there for two or three months and they look the same as when we put them in. They just, they're just, you can tell when they come off the trailer, it was, you know, they're just not going to do it. So if we do have to source more, uh, beef in or animals in for the grass finish program i i got a good friend that, and producer that's similar mindset similar type of cattle that that we will will work back and forth on so that's that's one thing that's that's changing like we've historically we've done heifers in our grass finish program and uh we'll do heifers again next year but then the year after that we're probably going to switch to to running steers we haven't done that yet um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of was my goal eventually was to be able to run all the steers to the grass finish program and then the heifers we can market or the, the females we can market the different directions. So do you see quite a bit of an upside potential yet in the demand out there for the grass fed beef, yeah. especially if you can uh, get these results back and, and you mentioned that Omega ratio, but you might just mention how high, how far above the industry standard that is. You know, I, the closer you get to one to one, the better, is is my understanding. And you know, you see, you see data from maybe feedlot beef is eight to one, maybe it's thirty to one. You know, and and you know, you can have high quality grain finished beef. You know, and it it could be better than the worst grass finished beef. You know, so so I really, I really. I don't want to dog, you know, the grain finished beef business as well, but it's, but I think, you know, one of the things that we see is, and it just makes perfect sense. All this stuff is connected, you know, what the animals eat and what you eat, it's all connected. And it's, it's the same biology as what's in the soil. And um, like some of the mineral analysis that we've got back from that, um, that study, you know, our, our soils are naturally deficient in copper. And so we supplement copper and the minerals, but but then the beef comes back that it's it's low in copper. So so you know what the animals are eating, you know is re it's reflective of what what's going into the into the meat, and that's going to be reflective of of what you know you and I are eating as well. So I I really think that there's a lot to that that they're just starting to really learn learn about. So it's going to be exciting to see the results from this. Yeah. Yeah, it will be. And and for those of you not familiar with it, uh, Dr. Stefan Van Vliet now, I think he's at Utah State, I believe, is kind of heading up this program and this project. The Understanding Ag guys have worked with this a lot. Uh, Dan Kittredge with the Bionutrient Food Density Association. So it's a big project. And, and I think you're going to hear a lot of buzz about it in the coming years. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. Um, you talked a lot about infiltration. You've you've mentioned multiple times that you know your soils, you know, fairly high clay content, just are not naturally good uh, high infiltration type soils. They don't take water that well. Talk a little bit about when you got that five inch rain in June. How much runoff did you have on these well established perennial soils versus you showed the picture of your sixty inch corn, which obviously didn't catch all of that. Yep, for sure. How do you, have you tested infiltration rates where you've had yes. perennials three plus years? So we've tested infiltration rates and I, um, a lot of times it doesn't show a lot better like in those perennials. And, and I don't, I don't know that I put a lot of faith in that. I think if you did a transect and you did an infiltration ring exactly every three feet for, you know, 50, whatever transects, I think it would look different, mm -hmm. uh, but just based on observation and that's uh, strict what I'm going by here is, yeah, we got that five inches and it was about a three hour rainfall event and we had runoff and those perennials. And I can tell because, you know, a lot of those fields are terraced. So 
when you go out there and there's water standing in the terraces, you know, we, well, there was water moving mm-hmm. off of those fields at some point, but, but what you notice is I have no doubt that we took in more water because when you walk out there and you go to move cattle, I mean, it's just, it's like a sponge and that, that soil is so wet to death compared to the cropland fields. And then it stays wet so much longer, like the cropland fields and well, that five inch rain and three days later, there was dirt blowing in this area, like it sealed them off. And those perennial fields stayed wet for a long time. So, and and that goes, you see that all summer long, like especially the last two summers, we've got rain in May and June, and then it's shut off. And and we're still growing forage all summer when when the set stock pastures are burned up. So, so yeah, that's, that's a big deal. Like, you know, I, I would venture to guess that we might lose half of our rainfall to runoff. So, so what can we produce if we can catch all of it or, or you know, three fourths of it or 90% of it? And we're seeing that. And a lot of that is the, the resiliency that I've been showing in those pictures too, is how, is how well these things are bouncing back. Yeah. And the, the picture where you had the comparison of the three year perennial versus your Kernza, I mean, that, that that's yeah. pretty stunning. It is. Yeah. It's amazing. And I, you know, I think a lot of that's just diversity. You know, we don't know exactly what's all going on underneath there, but, but I think it's, there's a lot to, a lot to the diversity. Yeah. So, so, so just, just like no-till by itself wasn't enough. You know, we, we all kind of learned that after a few years of no-till and you saw those benefits start to tail off perennials, monoculture perennials by themselves aren't enough either. You yeah. need that exactly. diversity key in there. Yep. Um, you made the comment when you were talking about all the infrastructure, the time and the money and the energy you spent putting that in, you made the comment, it has to be easy to make it work. Talk a little bit more about that. You know, when you say it has to be easy, what, what, what pieces or what parts of it have to be made easy? Um, so the, the first year we tried this and we've hauled water for years with livestock integration, but the first year we did this, we had, we had a 2000 foot reel of HDP of, I think it was inch and a half or inch and a quarter HDP. And, and we would try to move this water line, you know, and reel this thing up. And, and we were moving cattle across the roads and we didn't have our, you know, the perimeter hot wires and all that established. And it was just, to be honest with you, it was a lot of work, you know, to physically, to make that happen. And it, um, so now with our infrastructure in place, like we just, we don't haul water anymore. We can get water within, you know, easily within a quarter mile of any place on our, on those, all those contiguous acres now easily. So, so that was probably the biggest thing. And and we knew, you know, then it, it goes to a function of time. We can go out and move cattle, you know, quickly if we need to. And um, yeah, just, if it's not easy, you're not going to do it very long so we've learned that yeah you know one of of the favorite guys that i ever heard talk just very entertaining incredibly educational and i'm sure you you heard him before too neil dennis he spoke at no tail in the plains many times Uh, unfortunately he passed away a number of years ago but he was so great at sharing his story and and i remember one of the talks he had was entitled if you're going to be lazy be good Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and that's that's kind of the same concept you know it's like you know not that he was lazy because he was an incredibly hard worker and and as all of us are and, and you're not making it easy because you're lazy you're making it yeah you know, maybe convenient is a better word you're making it convenient yeah. so it actually gets done right and yeah. it doesn't take the entire day to do exactly and then so i had a, a visit with a neighbor here it was a week or so ago and he, and he, and he tried this for a year and he saw results, but he just commented to me on the time it takes. Like we spend, you know, it takes time to do this every morning. Somebody's got to do this. And, and I got to thinking about that comment on the time and, and I really, it really got me thinking like there isn't anything that I have done on my farm or ranch that I have seen the results that we see by devoting this time to managing our grazing, like that we can physically see there's, there's nothing on our farm that compares to this. So, 
So if that's true, and it is true on our place, why would not, why wouldn't you want to devote an hour a day to that type of management practice? How many hours a day do we devote to things that show no results whatsoever? So that's. Plus, plus, like you said, it's somewhat therapeutic. It's kind of your happy oh, place yeah. to go to. It is. It is. It's very therapeutic. So, yep. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's a great point. You know, how many hours a day do we spend working on things that have no return? Yeah, I may not want to know the answer. To that. I know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned you mentioned neighbors again, and you mentioned that you've got some neighbors starting to ask questions, starting to you know, and and I can imagine you know they look across the fence and see all that forage you have, and you know the golf course that they've got out there with nothing growing um i just i have i don't have you seen any of the episodes from peter bix ripped so deep yeah we, will, we will actually as a family we watched that over the last few weeks watched the whole thing so yeah yeah i just make a comment on that because it's such a powerful testimony not only to the type of grazing system they're yeah. doing but more so the power of connection between neighbors yeah i'm not yeah, that, I highly recommend watching that. You know, it's twenty bucks, I think, to rent the thing. It's it's a, it's well done, and it's and, and that's for all four parts. All of four, it. four parts, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we watched it as a family, and and uh, yeah, that that was a surprising thing at the end. You know, the last one. I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but it was that connection and how these these neighboring farmers really never talked to each other before, and now all of a sudden mm -hmm. these neighboring farmers are interested in how do we start to implement some of these practices? So it's very encouraging, you know, to see that. Yeah. So if, if you haven't seen that, Jonathan just posted it in the chat there too, go to rootsodeep.org. Peter Beck is a filmmaker out of Arizona state. Uh, he's actually been in live in person to a couple of our regen nexus events in Scottsdale. We've showed some of the episodes at our conference uh, regen nexus conference in Omaha but it's a very powerful, uh, again, super scientific, deep science study of, you know, the regenerative grazing, like what Kevin is doing and conventional grazing and, and with paired sets of neighbors right across fence lines from each other. So they pull the science from both sides of that fence, which is a fascinating study by itself. But the sociological aspect of the neighbor connections is, and it, it's a sensitive subject, mm -hmm. but I think Peter, Vic just does a great job of handling it and taking something that could be very uncomfortable and 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 really uh, making it work. And so, if you haven't seen that, please yep. please go watch that. We'd be we'd love to know what you think about that. Uh, but I definitely think it's well worth the uh, twenty bucks to. You know, where else can you watch four? You know, and they're what about an hour long each yeah, episode. Yeah, probably so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty cheap entertainment for a few. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> way better than most stuff that's on. Yeah. I um, want to get to a few questions that people are asking here, Kevin. Uh, so Buck is from Southwest Oklahoma. Uh, he's asking, do you have any cool season perennials mixed in for grazing in the winter? You know, um, I think he's talking about, you know, you talked about stockpile grazing some. Are you doing the stockpile grazing mostly with your warm season or the cool season? Um, both. <laughs> but our, our cool season pasture just with the drought the last three years just the cool season by itself just really don't perform in our environment. Okay. Um, we do, we have the, the Western wheatgrass and the Canada wild rye in our diverse mixes. And those, if we get rain in the or snow or whatever in the winter, those will green up like, and that's what we stockpiled graze last year. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm tempted to try another cool season pasture just with a lot more diversity just to see if we can make it work here. Um, yeah. So, see, I don't know if that answered that question or not. Yeah. But. You, you know, as, as people think about converting to perennials, one of the questions I always ask them is, you know, how long are you planning on leaving it in? Because you're only going to leave it in for five years. Well, you can't spend a hundred plus dollars an acre and have to wait till the third year to get any production and then take it out a couple years later, like with warm season. That's that's got to be a what do you think probably at least a ten to fifteen year commitment. Yeah, I think I think on what I've done, it's about ten years. So um, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. The cool season mixes they establish faster. 
they also seem to kind of peter out faster too yeah. from so five years is, is very yeah. reasonable yeah i think five years is is going to be a good a good number five you know if you can get five or six years out of them you're probably going to be terminating them anyway and, and yeah. doing something different yeah. but so i think i think it kind of depends on what your goals are and then sure. it's it'll be really interesting to hear you report down the road what the long-term effects you know as you rotate these systems in and out of perennials you know how did the annual cropping go behind that i can only imagine right. that, that soil structure the organic matter the biology is going to really get you some good crops for a number of years right. and that's you know that's something you, they did at the minokin farm obviously they have the the perennial pasture and it's i think five years maybe and and Jay will will say, you know, they see the organic matter ticks up in those five years and the pH goes to neutral. But then when they start cropping it again, the organic matter goes back down, mm -hmm. you know, and the pH goes back, you know, the way it was before. So it's not like you're going to plant these perennials and that's going to stay that way if you go back to annual cropping. So, yeah, yeah, it's, that's a good point. The, the warm season mixes I've grown, um, I think. You know, ten year. That's what I amortize the cost out over ten years. And you can spend well the lot. Yeah, I mean, you can easily spend one hundred fifty dollars an acre on that mix. Yeah. So, um, which sounds like a lot, but if you say fifteen dollars an acre per yeah. year for seed, well, hey, that's pretty cheap. Yeah, and and uh, some of these I don't know that I'll ever break out. I mean, they just keep getting better and better. And you know, if if we can make money, keep doing it. I you know I don't know that I'll ever break them. At least in my lifetime, back well, out. So. Especially. If Corn stays at three dollars and exactly, cents. exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no incentive to to, to oh. do that. I mean, you've got, yeah. you you've got that set up really well for, you yeah, know, future production and for future generations. There, um, I want to you you mentioned aggregation at depth, and I don't know if you've listened to or if people listening here, if you heard the podcast that John Kemp did with Rick Clark. Yes. Uh, came out a few weeks ago. It was when we did a deal at Rick's place in Indiana. We had Christine Jones come in there. And so that whole podcast was kind of a rehash of what uh, a small group of us had learned with Dr. Jones there. And one of the things they talked about extensively is she talked about how important it was to fix carbon and have aggregation of depth, 30, 40 inches deep, you know, a meter deep, as she was saying. And that's just such a concept, you know, when we soil test, you know, zero to six, zero to eight, what's our organic matter there? And, you know, she's saying that doesn't matter near as much because that's always cycling and it's always changing, but what matters is getting it deep. So how deep do those chicory roots go? Those alfalfa uh, crown, dash, how deep are those? I don't know how deep they are. I know we dug those soil pits when Jay was there and they were three or four foot deep and they were, yeah, still, we were still, still a big, a still big, a big root. Yeah, there. they were still big down there. So yeah, how far down they go? Probably 10, 12 feet. I would guess. So yeah. 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 So that's one thing that you know, I listened to that podcast too, and they made a comment on there about and you you were there obviously, but it was a comment on um the fastest way to build soil or something that was plant a diverse cover crop, let it get at the almost reproductive stage. Mm -hmm terminate it however way and then plant another one and so we do some of that full season stuff you know with with uh cover crops annuals but i guess part of that is your context to like for us and in, in our environments and brittle environments in the western great plains and in general we go through these times where we just can't we just don't know if the annuals are going to grow and sometimes they don't grow where if at least with these perennial systems, there's there's always cover on the soil and there's always a living root there. Yeah. And I think I think that's why we're seeing, you know, a lot of the results we're seeing. So yeah. It's it's funny because they talked about it a little bit in that podcast, but throughout the whole course of that day, it was a bit of a running joke because Rick Clark, you know, chicory is a bane plant for him because it, in an organic no-till situation, it's really hard to get rid of. And Christine just kept saying, why do you want to get rid of it? It's such a great plant. She kept pointing out dandelions. Dandelions are such a great plant. So he's having to kind of rethink these things that, you know, he thought are problems. How do you embrace them? But, well, obviously, chicory is a huge, hugely beneficial in a yeah. crazy situation. Yeah, in a crazy situation. I don't know. Yeah, they're all good plants, you know. Yeah. I guess some are better than others. But 
the chat. Yeah. So that's the advantage of that. So. Yeah. So uh, we, one of the people asking a question here, uh, they're asking, could you go back and show the quotes again that you had in your presentation? Oh, sure. Figure out how to do it. Maybe didn't catch, catch the quotes there. Um, whoops. Yeah, the, the first one I got from, that was from Ramsey for Profit. And I, uh, I say, I tell myself that every single day. There's the first one. You have the perfect system in place to get the same results you are currently getting. So in other and words, if, that you're, is. if you're happy with where you're at, don't change anything. Exactly. If and you're not happy, you better change something. Exactly. And we and we talk about making changes. You know, everybody does. And it's like, unless you make those changes or any change, then then it's not then it's not going to change. Yeah. So so there was the first one. And the other one I as soon as I heard this on Working Cows podcast, I stopped and had to write it down from Burke Tykert. So he was, I really enjoy him. So, yeah. Yeah. So become open minded, be open to new ideas, different ways of doing things, but right. don't, don't, be, don't go broke doing them. Don't be gullible. Yeah. And, you know, don't, don't make the switch on all your acres at once. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we hear a lot of things, you know, it's, you know, quit putting fertilizer on or put this on. And it's like, you might not want to do that on your whole farm or plant perennials. Yeah. You know, you might want to play with it a little first. So. Yeah. Well, and that, that might be, we're, we're running up against our uh, end of our hour here or actually just a little bit over. It's been such good content, but maybe that'll be a good way to kind of close out. Kevin is what advice would you have to somebody who wants to get started, who wants to be open-minded doesn't want to be gullible, doesn't want to risk the whole farm doing it. What advice would you give to them of how they could get started doing some of these things? Yeah, that, the biggest thing is just get started. You know, it's, it, it is truly a mindset shift. And, you know, to be honest with you, I struggled that with that for a long time as well. And I don't know if it just came with age, you know, uh, um, or why, but but now I'm just never content with what we're doing and I want to find ways to be better and do better. And I guess as far as advice is you just, you just have to start somewhere and um, go out and, you know, go to all these things. We're talking about no toe on the planes and CCTA's meeting and watch these or listen to podcasts and go to Dakota lakes and Minokan farm and get these ideas and think about how, how can you implement them on your farm? Because everybody's context is different, you know, and that's okay. Um, some things you're just not going to be able to do, but, but the biggest thing is just, you just have to make your mind up that, you know, we're going to try some of these things. So. Um, yeah, a great point. And it's never been easier to get that information, you know, YouTube, yeah. you know, we, this, this, this whole series will be on our YouTube channel. There's never been an easier time to get the information. In fact, the biggest problem is there's so much information right. to be good at filtering out what's the most important. Yeah. And and that's where that quote I think is important because there is a lot of information out there and some of it looks really cool on a YouTube video or, or whatever, you know, and, and some of it, yeah, just might not work, but, and probably the biggest thing, the biggest advice I'd have to any, anybody is, is go visit people's farms and get out of your, yeah. your own zone and, I, you know, I'm not on social media or, you know, I look at some of this stuff, go to conferences, but, and I invite anybody in the world, you know, if you want to see what we're doing, the best way to learn is to come. I will be happy to show you what we're doing and tell you what we've done wrong and try to help you and teach you. And, and, and I've learned so much just doing that is just going to other places and, and trying to figure that out. So, mm -hmm. so, so for me, that's, that would be my number one. Yeah, piece of advice because go, because go if you never go wrong. yeah if you never do that go back to that first quote if you never get yeah. out and see other places you're stuck right here yeah that's right that's where you're stuck yeah. so yeah so, so. Yeah, you, you got to get out and and meet people and 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 see what's being done yeah. for your, for yourself so well that's that's great advice to end on I think Kevin again you know we appreciate you being on here so much. You'd like to get a hold of Kevin to either do a tourist place or buy some sure. grass-fed beef. 
uh, just just contact Green Cover. We've got his contact information. We'd be happy to pass that on to you yep. if you're interested in that. Next week will be the last episode in this series of integrating livestock producers. Uh, we're closing it out with Brad McIntyre. Brad and his family uh, farm up in the Treasure Valley of Idaho, the Boise, Idaho area. In fact, Brad was just here touring our place a couple of days ago. Uh, they've got a family reunion, but uh, he'll be back in Idaho and we'll be on speaking even more uh, specifically about marketing their products. They've got 3,000 lane hens, they, they raise hogs, they raise beef, and they're marketing all of this, uh, most of this directly to the consumer. In addition, Brad also grows our turnips and our collards and our Ethiopian cabbage and teff grass. He's a big seed grower and cleans a lot of seed for us up there in Idaho as well. So it'll be a real fascinating conversation and a great way uh, to end a great webinar series. So Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, have a great day. Thanks.